Welcome to the presentation, Central Bank Digital Currency, Threats and Vulnerabilities. We will start with a, with a background, uh, then we move over to a detailed system description of the prototype, system components, um, uh, and uh, point out functions that need protection, information to secure, and secure communication. Then we will deep dive into vulnerabilities that were found in the retail central bank digital currency prototype for phase one. And then I have to talk about everything else that needs to be handled before going to production. And we'll end with a short description of the solutions and an even shorter summary. There will be lots of slides and lots of information and I have to talk really, really fast. So don't forget to, to note down interesting slides if you want to go back and actually understand what I have said. Um, so where to start? Um, uh, my name is Ian Vitek. I'm uh, born in uh, Stockholm, Sweden and starting doing penetration tests in 1996. Um, um, I moved from being consultant to work at a, a big retail banking company in Sweden and uh, started with a computer emergency response team. Uh, and after a couple of years, I moved into information security. I've been working at the Risk Bank for eight years, and uh, but the last two with the central bank digital currency. Um, my interests are web application security, a network layer 2, I'm a writer on Macoff. Um, I love party tricks like DNA attacks and local pin bypass attacks and other attacks you can do at the bar counter. Um, I also have attended DEF CON many years. Uh, my first DEF CON was DEF CON 6 and I've been speaker and, and helped out uh, uh, at DEF CON with other things during the years. Um, the Central Bank of Sweden, Sveits Riksbank, is a very small central bank. It's just maybe 350 employees. Uh, I have also a, a small disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in the presentation are mine and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the Riksbank. So, the eCrona project. Uh, why central bank digital currency? I will not talk about the politics here, but I have to mention that uh, the uh, physical cash in Sweden has uh, been declining. Um, uh, commercial banks has a, a very good and widespread digital ID and also a payment service called Swish. And Swish is connected to one of your bank accounts. So it's very easy to do person-to-person -person transfers. And now we also can do payments in stores. So in Sweden, most of the transfers are bank transfers, card payments, or Swish transfers. Uh, the, the Central Bank of Sweden thinks that should be a, a digital alternative to physical cash. Um, the eCrona project uh, started in, at the Riks Bank, and um, and we were we need a, we want to run a pilot to see how a how a central bank digital currency should work. So we did a pre first started with a procurement. We had some requirements, of course. We didn't have um, requirements of uh, the technology uh, that should be used, but we had security requirements, functional requirements like user stories, and non-functional requirements. And there were a winning company, and the winning company has developed a prototype, uh, and uh, I will talk about that prototype of phase one, the year one. We are still working on the, on the prototype, uh, but we call it now phase two, that this presentation is, is only focused on the phase one prototype. The goal of this presentation is to share insights and of the security challenges of building a prototype of a two-tier retail central bank digital currency based on blockchain and 
and uh, value-based tokens. So, we'll now go into the detailed system description of the prototype. So the prototype in phase one is a blockchain with value-based tokens in a two-tier model. So we have a user, we have an app. In the app, there are logic, of course, and we have stored information uh, on, in, in the payment instrument. The payment instrument could be like a mobile phone, but we have also developed a, a payment card, a smart card that can handle these, um, these uh, payments. So the logic in the, in the, in the app is that need to be secure is, is for example, a pin, uh, pin handling, signing the transaction, encryption. And the, on the disk of the application, we store, of course, the pin verification, uh, the pin, you can call just pin. And private key, private keys for, for the tokens, authentication keys and message keys. Um, so we have lots of things in the app and, and on the mobile or payment device, uh, payment instrument that needs uh, protection. But we'll not talk about anything about the tax about, against the user or user interface. Um, and the app will, con will um, connect to uh, the payment service provider's business logic. So, um, so the arrows here in the in the presentation is that the arrows is also has to need uh, some type of protection, of course. So in the payment service provider's uh, business logic, we have authentication, push messages like Firebase. If you want any limits, like how, how big transfers could be or how many transfers you can do. This is um, limits in the, in the business logic, uh, and we have lots of back office functions uh, here. Um, and this is stored in database and also on the disk, of course, but I just write the database here. So we need a storage of authentication keys, payment history, customer data, message keys, and so on somewhere. And, and all these functions and information needs protection. But the business logic communicates with the payment service provider's uh, Corda node. And the Corda node handles the security and logic of token transactions, token verification, and wallet management. And the database of the Corda node, the payment service provider's Corda node, they of course need to have the, the user public keys, wallets, tokens, backchain, I will come back to what backchain is, and lots of certificates. But you, you can't do anything if you don't have any, any money or tokens in this case. So at the, at the Rix Bank also has a Corda node. And the security logic here is issue and redeem, uh, token verification, and Corda network management. Uh, the information is handled on that Corda node. So we have to secure the public keys and back chain and certificates. Um, but when doing, it, when doing a transaction, the consensus mechanism of the Corda is a Corda notary. So this is a consensus mechanism in the prototype of phase one. And then if you are doing a transaction, you have to check for uh, double spans. So the Corda notary prevents double spans and it also signs that transaction. To that Corda node, we have a, uh, a database where we have like keys and certificates, but we have also the hashes of tokens. These are the hashes, on, uh, these are the tokens that are spent, information about spent tokens. So if you can remove tokens from this database, you can spend tokens once more and do double spend. So it's very important that it's, it's secure. But uh, the Rix Bank also has business logic. We have lots of back office functions and we want to 
uh, be able to pay interest for uh, the, the money in circulation. And we also have information about the, the, the outstanding central bank digital currency that's in circulation. We also have connections to the, to, to the Riksbank real-time gross settlement system. Uh, this is an RTGS system that most central banks have, but we'll not talk about that because that has nothing to do about the threat and vulnerabilities of, of this prototype. But uh, to be able to pay, uh, you know, I know that technicians love uh, public keys, uh, but normal users, we want some similar way to do, do payments, like a phone number or email address or an alias or something. So we have an alias database, and that handles uh, like add and move aliases and map uh, alias to a per, uh, payment service provider and wallet. And these aliases and, pay, uh, and wallets are stored in the database. And this is also a critical part of the solution because if you, you can imagine what happens if you change that, that uh, um, all aliases pointed, pointed to your wallet. Uh, so of course it has to be secured also. But we also have lots of other payment service providers in our prototype so we can do payment service provider to payment service provider um, payments. Uh, so, yeah. so what is backchain uh, and how to exploit bad implementation? Um, so, um, to explain this in a very simple way, the Riksbank Corda node, um, uh, so we have a, a Corda node at the Riksbank, and if payment service provider needs tokens, money, uh, it asks for an issue, and Riksbank makes that issue. So this is how it looks in a very simple way. So from nothing, uh, the Corda uh, starts with a transaction. The actual transaction number here is uh, is a very long binary number, but I just write one here as an example to simplify it. And in that transaction, we have one token. And the token, the name of the token, is the, the transaction ID and the index of, which, of, of the token. So this is the first token in transaction number one. Amount is 1,000, owner is payment service provider one, and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, the Riks Bank has uh, signed this transaction as a new reference. It's from Inner. Uh, then maybe user A wants to withdraw 200. Um, then there is something called token selection. So Corda will look for uh, for uh, for token or tokens that can that has 200. So it finds this token and locks it. That means that no one else can touch this token during this process. Uh, uh, then Corda creates transaction, another transaction, in this example number two, and creates one output token here. So this token is called the two, and this is the first, uh, first token of the transaction two. It's a 200, it's owned by user A, so this is the public key for user A here, and it's signed by, by payment service provider one, and it has a reference. So this token derives from, uh, from, uh, from this token. Uh, the first token of transaction one. But we have this change here also. So user A gets 200, but the payment service provider actually creates its own change of 800. And then it's called, uh, that token is called, uh, it's, it's a second token in transaction two. And its owner is PSP1, and the sign is signed by PSP1. 
and it also has the same reference uh, um, points to that that um, transaction. Then everything is done. The, the first token here is marked as spent. Uh, you can't use that anymore. And then maybe one day user A want to make a transfer to user B at PSP2. So user A want to, to send user B 50. So the token selection here looks for a token owned by user A that could handle this transaction. So it finds it, locks it, creates a, another transaction, makes one output token, um, uh, uh, and also the change to user A. This is sent to, to payment service provider two. So payment service provider two uh, get, uh, also get these tokens. Um, so payment service provider two, to verify the authenticity, to see that this is valid, the payment, uh, the core node of payment service provider two must verify it by looking at all earlier transactions. But it has only uh, that transaction three. So payment service provider two core node will ask for all earlier transactions leading up to this transaction. So it, it will ask payment service provider one for the back chain here. So, so payment service provider two can verify the references here. So it points back to this transaction, so it points out to this transaction, and this is the issue. So then we have the whole back chain from the issuing to the transaction number three. And now the payment, uh, the core node of payment service provider two can verify all the signatures and see that the chain is not broken. This is very important and I will come back to this later. And the prototype <coughs> for phase one was built on Corda 4.5 and, and uh, it corresponds corresponding token SDK. Um, um, most of the information is very simplified, of course, and the bugs in the prototype uh, in the design, uh, I have verified them in Corda 4.7 also. Um, so, how to exploit token selection along back chains? So, what can a user do if they want to mess things up? They can withdraw three and deposit two. So, this is a start. So, when a user wants to withdraw three, uh, it will take 200 from the PSP1. And the PSP1 will create a change, of, uh, so it, it um, uh, receives a token of 197, but user A will receive a token of 3. Then it wants to deposit 2. It will look for, for a token uh, that can be deposited uh, or used for depositing, and will find this token 3 and create a new token of 1 that the change back to user A. and a token uh, of two, uh, so the money goes back to PSP one. The two go back to PSP one. To make things a little bit clearer how this work, I will clean this up a little bit. So I move all historic transactions um, um, to the to the left and adjust all the tokens. And so what? A does is he does this over and over again. So we withdraw three, so now it's 984, and and then he deposits two, and he gets that, and it's moved over. And you can do this many, many, many times. You get many tokens, many historic tokens, and and in the end the user A deposit all his tokens. So all the tokens that, is, that I have, have, all hundreds of them are deposited to PSP1. So now PSP1 have all the historic tokens and all the tokens that are still valid, not spent. 
that sometime in the future, maybe the administrator of payment service provider one want to redeem and move it back to Riks Bank, sell the, the tokens back to Riks Bank to get uh, Svenska, Swedish uh, uh, kroner instead. And what happens is that all the tokens is moved over to the Riks Bank Corva node. And the Riks Bank Corva node wants to validate uh, the, 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 the tokens. And, and um, to do so, it needs uh, the history and the back chain, actually, of all the tokens that, that are redeemed. And this will draw lots of resources on the Riksbank Corridor node. And the Riksbank Corridor can actually crash if it's not set up or the system is not designed correctly. I will go into the consequence a little bit later, but I want to describe there are other setups that gives better effect. So if you're using several issued tokens, you also can start with several, you will get several miracle trees. And it's, it's, this is a simple way of describing it. It's like payment service provider one has, has three issued tokens. Payment service, pro, pro, uh, payment service provider one has done one issue of 1,500, one issue of 2,000, and one issue of 3,000. And user A does a withdrawal of 100, waits for, 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 for some time, and make another issue, uh, make another withdrawal. Maybe it will get um, uh, a token from another issued, issued token. Uh, and then the user splits up his tokens to several. Maybe he has a, a, use, a, a, a friend, user B. So user A sends lots of small transactions to user B. And that will split up his tokens to very many small parts. And then user B sends them back to user A, but in one big chunk. So now we are getting a, a, a very complex back chain. And if user A does this over and over again, so it also we have lots of tokens and very long back chain, we will get the transaction of death. And what can we do with the transaction of death? It can permanently lock tokens. Because when you're sending transaction of death to someone, it may crash the Corda nodes. And sometimes crashes give inconsistencies. So if user A want to transfer five, this transaction of death, this is a, the, the five here is, is, a, is a transaction with a many tokens and a very long back chain. And it sends it to user C to a, to a payment service provider that has not seen any of these tokens or back chains before. So somewhere in this process, someone will have to, to send to the Riksbank Corda node, please mark this transaction or token as used. But when doing this transaction of death, I, I am able to, to crash both payment service provider one, the, the one payment service provider I'm, 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 I'm standing from, but also the receiving uh, party. So both nodes can crash, one can crash, two can crash. It depends on the setup, resources, and so on, the design. But when this crash happens, it also can happen before the Corda nodes actually mark them as, as uh, spent. So in this, in the test I have done, 
the Corda, the width from Corda notary marked this transaction as used. This token is used, but this token is available for the payment service provider. So user A can't, can, can't use his wallet anymore because you look at your wallet, you see the, 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 the amount, uh, the balance, it's just like 100. But when you try to transfer them, uh, the Corda node will say some of them, the, the tokens in this transaction are marked as used and therefore you can't make any, any transfer from this wallet. The, the, the wallet is permanently disabled or, or, or it's not functioning any, anymore as you want it. And it has to be, you have to solve the inconsistencies <clears throat> of, uh, of, of this somehow. There are other design weaknesses that you have to look out for. It's um, uh, network problems, timeouts, in-memory token selection, and locked tokens until restarted. So, so card payments in the prototype phase one is a signed transaction on the smart card traveling through the payment service provider of the merchant to the card holder pay payment service provider. And then the, the transaction is going back from payment service provider three to payment service provider one in this example. So what I did in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the prototype for phase one, that I, I, I did card payments every second or so, as fast as I could. I did small card payments and and when I'm doing these card payments, um, payment service provider one will communicate with uh, the Wix Bank Corda node to, to mark, to say that, that, that these tokens used in the card payments um, is, um, is, uh, is, uh, is spent. But when I'm doing these card payments, I just uh, killed the Corda notary process. But, I'm, but still, <laughs> when the process, the Corda notary is down, I still continue to doing card payments. So now errors start to happen. So payment service provider one will get timeouts and will send errors back to payment service provider three. And they will say some of the tokens you are using has not been spent because you have timeouts. But when I start up the Rick's Bank uh, card and notary, I still continue to do card payments. And somewhere here, it gets mixed up. Um, so some of the transaction will be marked as, as used, but, but um, in memory of, of uh, the payment service provider three, the tokens are still marked as available. Um, this is, this is um, very easy to, to fix. You just restart the PSP3 Corda node and, and uh, the tokens uh, will get updated in the correct way and, and marked as spent here also in the, in the, in the, at the payment service provider 3. But these are very complex processes and you have to be sure that the right tokens are marked spent where and when you should do that uh, uh, to be able to not have these type of, of um, weaknesses in the system. Um, and there were some, some people at uh, ING that found out that also an evil payment service provider can lock tokens that other payment service providers has. 
So in this example, um, user A want to send uh, five uh, to uh, to uh, to user C at payment service prior three. Normal transaction. So A sends tokens to uh, to payment service. Uh, to, to user C at payment service provider 3. And that payment service provider 3 will mark that token as spent. So the, the, the token in this transaction is spent and it's, it's marked in the, in the Rix Bank called a notary. Everything is fine. But, but the, so, I, so the token 2 is available, of course. And the token one was spent in the transaction. Everything is fine. But as, as you are the evil payment service provider here, you actually have information about token number two. So you can send a transaction to the Rix Bank Corda notary node to say, well, uh, the, the token two is also spent. So now, Token two is, is is spent, and the user C can't use his token anymore because the Rix Bank notary node has marked it as, as as spent. This is how the, the the setup for the prototype for for the Rix Bank uh, uh, phase one uh, is done. It's a non-validating notary node. It can be solved by by changing into a validating. A nuclear node, and then you can't uh, do this uh, attack anymore. Um, so you have to take the, this in, into account too. I also have an ending note on token selection. Uh, so if if um, if a uh, payment service provider uh, want to make a, a redeem, in this example, the the payment service provider. Uh, one has three tokens in its vault uh, owned by payment service provider one. There's one token of two million, one token of one million, another token of one million. So the administrator wants to make a redeem of three and a half million. But if a user just milliseconds before want to make a withdrawal of 50, the corda will start doing that by locking one of the tokens. And Corda will tell the administrator, well, you don't have 3.5 million right now because you only have 3 million available. You have to try again later. But the user A will get his 50. This is not a big problem if you just have one user. But if you have millions of users that always is trying to do withdraw, it will be very hard to, to do some of the back office functions. You have to have a design that can handle this. It just was a, a parenthesis uh, of the challenges that we have had. Um, then, now we move over to privacy problems. So, as we talked about before, about um, uh, the back chain, to be able to verify the authenticity of all the of the tokens, all historic transactions for that token is needed. For PSP to verify this token, it needs all the historic transactions. So PSP two can see how PSP one have, have done one issue and and how user A withdrawn two hundred for paying this token to a user on PSP2. But older and longer backchains reveals more. So what can an administrator of PSP2 see? Well, if the PSP2 get one transaction of 60, to verify the authenticity of this token, it needs all the historic transactions deriving up to this, this token. So where does this 60 come from? 
So the payment, the kernel of those payments service provider two will get the back chain to see that user G from PSB1 has sent 50, uh, a token of 50 to, to user A. And user C from PSB3 has sent a token of 20 to. So this 60 contains, it doesn't matter, 20 from this token and, and 40 from this token, or maybe 50 from this token and 10 from this token. Doesn't matter, but both of these tokens were used in this transaction here. But where do, does these tokens come from? So the Corda node will go out on the Corda network and get all the back chain. And the back chain is all the transaction arriving to this, um, uh, this um, token. Uh, and it needs to, to go back to the issuing. Um, so it will continue going back and back. So it will see that the, 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 the token of 50 comes from another token of 50 that comes from a transaction of 325. And, and uh, that user 365 comes from three other tokens. So and then we come back to the, to the issuing here. So when we have the whole chain back to the issuing, we have all the transactions leading up to this, to this token. Now the Corda network can verify the authenticity of the token by verifying all the signatures, see that the, the, the chain is not broken. That the administrator of payment service provider 2 can also go into the Corda node to see all these historic transactions. To do this more practically. So I have, I have written some, some small scripts to, to be able to visualize the back chain and the historic transactions. So in this practical example, you are, I'm running a Corda node of PSP2, and, and I'm an administrator of uh, Payment Service Provider 2, and with only information on, from the Payment Service Provider 2 Corda node and the business layer of Payment Service Provider 2, I'd be able to get the back chain and visualize it and, and, and I, can, I will practically show you how this is done. So what we have to do is extract the back chain, get the, all the transactions in the back chain, maybe do some uh, data mining and then visualize it. So this is how you should do that. Uh, so to, to get the back chain, you log into the PSP2 Corda node, and in the Corda process also has a, a Corda shell. So uh, you log into the PSP2 Corda node and start the Corda node shell. And then you run the command internal verify transaction snapshot. When running this command, Corda will output all verified transactions, all transactions it, 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 it knows about, and also about all the back chain transactions. It's just a mess, but I just, for example, points out one transaction here. This is how one transaction from that command looks like. We have the, 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 the transaction ID first, transaction ID. We have also the signer of this transaction. So we know uh, who, who is a payer here. So this is uh, the, the, the from address. And here are the inputs of this transaction. And this shows um, the tokens from the input. It can be, be one or more tokens. And here is um, it, it, the naming here is a, this is the old transaction and this is a token. The first token in this old transaction 
was the input token for, for this transaction. And then we have output tokens. The first output tokens is always a payee who gets the transaction. So this is a public key of the payee. And here we can see the amount. If there are a second output, it is a change that the, 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 the owner of the token gets back. You can see the public key of the change is the same as the signer of the, the transaction. So what we do now is just write a small script that takes out the payer, the from, and who is the payee receiving the amount. That's all what we need. But I also take out if there are any inputs. If there, if there are no inputs in this transaction, I know it's a transaction from the Wix Bank, because the Wix Bank is the only one that can issue transactions. When you issue a transaction, there are no, no input tokens. I can also look at the, the, the public key. If the public key is a, is a couple of bytes shorter, it's a, it's a, in, in our prototype for phase one, it's a payment service provider. So users has a little bit longer keys. So now we can see who's the Wix Bank, who's the, the, the payment service providers, and what's users. So I just extract all those uh, transactions and create a JSON file. So it just says from this public key to this public key and the amount. So it's just thousands of thousands of, of transactions in the JSON file. And that's all we need right now. Uh, but you maybe want to have a, a wallet IDs. And wallet IDs are, can be found in the, in the business layer of the, uh, um, in, in the business layer of the, the, the payment service provider too. So if you, if you have a, and, uh, an app, you want to go see the, the, the transaction history, your, your historic transactions. And that's stored in the business layer. So the administrator of the payment service provider too can go in and, and, uh, and uh, look there. Uh, so this is a user history record extract from the payment to business layer. So here we have the transaction ID. And actually, that's the same transaction ID that was um, uh, in, the, in the back chain. So here we can map the, the payer and payee wallet ID. But there are other ways to do it also. Because if you have, um, if, uh, if one of my user has received a payment or sent a payment to someone, I have their wallet ID in my, my uh, uh, transaction history, of course. And then in Corda, you always can look up the public key for a wallet. So if I just look at my, my tra um, uh, transaction history, there are lots of wallet IDs, and I can just look up all the public addresses I, I know of, and then map them or, or enrich the, 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 the JSON file. So now I have an um, enriched JSON file and just pour that into an HTML file. And with the d3.js um, data driven documents um, uh, library called d3.js, um, I use a function called d3layout4s, and they just connect all those arrows, all those transactions from A to B, B to C automatically. So in my HTML file, I just say, I just point at the JSON file where, where I have the enriched uh, transactions. I set up the, the, the graph with the, with the uh, arrows and just print it. And it would look like this. Um, and, and so, so this is how the, the web page looks like. So I have here I can detect the Rix bank. Um, I can see one of the historic transactions to a payment service provider. So this is an issue. So 
this payment service provider has done an issue of 1 million. And from, them, from that 1 million, one user called, called this wallet ID on PSP1 has uh, withdrawn 1,337.10. So then I know this payment service provider is, um, is, um, uh, is payment service provider one. And this payment service provider from this wallet has done a transaction to see if I can get hold of it. No. So this uh, payment service provider three, and there has been two transactions to this payment service provider, th uh, the wallet on this payment for payment service provider three, and it's one transaction of 1,337.40 and 1,337.50. And then it comes to my payment service provider two here, to my user here at the payment service provider two. But when I received this payment of 1,337.60, I also get the all historic back chains. So I can now see all the, 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 the historic transaction leading up to this. Uh, and and um, yeah, so back chain and privacy. First, I have to say, even if you don't have the wallet ID, you have the, always the, the, the public key. And public keys are probably also personal identifiable information. And what, whichever technology you choose, you have to take this into account. And for some blockchain technologies, this can be a challenge. So we have to fix this in, in, uh, in phase two. And then we have everything else. Everything else that I have not talked about this, this in this presentation, and everything else that has to be sold before going to production in a token-based retail central bank digital currency. So we have performance and the, and, the, and the verification of the tokens. We have to solve if you have lots of lots of tokens or very long back chains. Um, it doesn't matter if, what technology you are, or you are using, you have to, to verify the authenticity and, and have the performance. And we have also a challenge with high availability and in-memory token selection. So all the, the token selection is done in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the memory of the Corda node. So how should you do 24 seven service? Like you, if you're gonna upgrade Corda or, or operating system. You can't just shut down the Corda node and, and, and disable payments uh, during this time. And how should you do disaster recovery after catastrophic failures? You can't just take a, a database backup and restore it because you are missing all the transactions leading up to that catastrophic failure. So you need some kind of area storage where you store all the transactions so you can build up or some, some in other ways um, uh, fix the inconsistency when restoring a, a, a corda node and then secure offline can that be done we have to look at it when we will look at it and we have problems with the, like non-repudiation meaning more or less authentic, authentic authorization. You have to be sure it's the right person uh, that has done the transaction and, and it can't be, it has to be proof, proof of that, that, it's, that this user has done this transaction. And then we, have, we can't miss not anything regarding information security, like access control, operational security, internet management, fraud detection, AML, uh, newer customer. We have all the IT security to solve 
or has to be in place before going in production. And of course, compliance, laws, regulation, financial compliance. And there are lots of solutions. There are many solutions for, uh, uh, for, for the presented challenges. So we're, I have talked about lots of, 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 of challenges, but there are lots of solutions. I will not go into the solutions this, uh, in this presentation. There are chain snipping, shipping, key rotation, zero knowledge proof, and other encryption to solve some things. And we have uh, validating notary notes to, to solve other things. Uh, we have hardware wallets. Um, uh, maybe could that work with uh, with offline and uh, restore uh, procedures and functions for correcting inconsistencies? Maybe we can fix everything. It's a technical project, and we probably can solve it technically. Technically, and Wixbank is now experimenting with other designs, and will also look at other technologies. Um, but I also have to say that every solution will have their own consequences. So if we just solve one thing, maybe we have other problems with it, like performance or, or, or other, other things. Um, I also want to say that during phase one, we had a design where the private key was on the payment instrument, but the tokens were on, on the Corda nodes. So um, uh, to experiment with uh, the payment service directly to uh, PSD2, we are trying to have both the, the key and the, the, the tokens on the payment service provider. And we're also looking for offline functionality, and then we will experiment with having the key and the tokens on the payment uh, instrument. And uh, uh, so we can do the transfer of tokens offline uh, to another uh, payment instrument device. So we are looking at lots of other fun things uh, during phase two, and we are not ready for production any time yet. And we probably have to change the the, the laws of the central bank in Sweden, the Riksbank law, before going to production anyway. Uh, so. But we will still look, still looking at the central bank digital currency and other technologies. Um, so the summary: the goal of this presentation is to share insights of the security challenge of building a prototype of a two-tier retail central bank digital currency based on a blockchain with value-based tokens. I have only presented threats, vulnerabilities, and security phase and some unknowns. I have not presented all the good design and all the positive lessons learned. That's another presentation. So we have we have invented and built so much good working parts, components, solution and design, and we have learned so much going for when we're now going forward and we'll look how we should build a system that should, could be, be run in production in Sweden. But I'm not talked about that in this presentation. That's the bad stuff, okay? Um, thank you for attending.